Good morning. It's so good to be gathered together for worship. Listen to Psalm 107. It's entitled, Let the Redeemed of the Lord Say So. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Whatever direction life uh, you find yourself in life right now, let's gather them together from all directions to praise the name of the Lord. Uh, we're going to sing, He Lives, and uh, Evelyn and Denner are going to help us with that. As we come before the Lord in this time, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we're able to worship. We're thankful for technology, but more than that, we're thankful for the Holy Spirit that brings us together in this bond of unity. Lord, we're thankful that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We're thankful for the cross. We're thankful for the empty tomb. We're thankful, God, for new life and spring and warmer days. We give all this time to you, God, acknowledging that without you, nothing else really matters. And so we give this to you as a sacrifice of praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Lose, 526. Scripture reading will be from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices 
with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Good morning, everyone. It's hard to believe it's the last Sunday of April, but here we are and looking forward to a message on forgiveness by Mike. As we worship the Lord together, we want to invite you to sing along with us on what a beautiful name it describes the beautiful name of Jesus, the wonderful name, and the powerful name. So let's praise him together.
a beautiful name and be a man of sorrows. And we sung this song at our Good Friday service. We want to sing it again as we remember Jesus, man of sorrows, um, powerful enough to forgive the sins of the world, and yet gentle enough to understand our temptation and stand with us. Man of sorrows.
Lord. Um, let's bow our heads wherever you are, and just quiet our hearts before the Lord, and let's seek his face today. We know that without him, um, we're helpless. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just want to thank you for this time that we can come before the throne, that you have paved a way. You have declared that we are righteous because of you, that we are accepted into the presence of Almighty God, into his holiness, into his majesty, into his greatness. Because we have been washed clean, we have been forgiven through faith in Jesus Christ, that it was nothing of our own doing, it was a gift. And so, Lord, we come before you and we praise you for your plan of salvation. We praise you for your mercy that is more, your love and great grace that washes us. Lord, you know our hearts. You know the anxieties that we've experienced. You know the troubles that we faced. Lord, some of us have been struggling financially. Some of us are worried about getting sick. Lord, some of us are wondering uh, what's gonna happen to our economy, what's gonna happen to our world. But God, we know that you are sovereign and we can trust you, but we cry out to you and we ask you, God, to help us. Lord, we thank you for all those that have survived the coronavirus or any other illness that they may have been struggling with and they're recovering. We thank you and praise you for that joy. We also grieve with those who are mourning loss today. Lord, I thank you for the life of my Aunt Helen, and I thank you for the reality that she's in heaven, um, praising you before the throne. But I also pray that you'd bring comfort to all of my extended family as we miss her and as we've had to say goodbye. Lord, I pray for the leaders of our country. Lord, they have many decisions ahead of them. We thank you for the decisions that are behind them. And Lord, we just pray that, that one day at a time, they would look to you. Lord, that none of us would get ahead of looking to our own strength, looking to our own abilities, looking to our own wisdom. Lord, your word says to trust in you with all of our hearts, to not lean on our own understanding, to acknowledge you in all of our ways, and you will direct our path. God, I pray for those that are truly laying down their lives in our country right now and in our world. I thank you for those that have been willing to be doctors and nurses and other first responders to get uh, get the help to people that need help. Lord, I pray that you would bless them and give them strength to keep going. Lord, we know it's branding season and we pray for safety as some finish calving, some go through that, some are um, just helping one another as neighbors as best they can. We look to you and we pray for wisdom, for direction and how, uh, how branding should look and how meals should look. And we just ask that the work could get done in safety and in harmony and uh, Lord, that the, just kind of the livelihood of the sand hills could keep going as well with all the uh, farming and planting and different things that are happening. Lord, we give even our summer plans to you. We think about high school graduation in July. And Lord, we just pray that you would open up the door for these community events to go forward. Lord, I pray that you would hear our hearts as we ask you for revival. Lord, we need you to change our hearts first and then those around us and then our nation, Lord, our extended communities. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for living as if we were in charge, as if life revolved around us. Lord, let us just make you famous by living for you. God, we do once again pray for our missionaries that you'd watch over them, and I pray that you would surround us all um, just with an understanding of your amazing amazing friendship and love for us. Teach us more about forgiveness. Teach us more about following your example. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we continue in worship, I have a question for you before our last song here. What is something that you wake up in the morning and you want more of? I can think of a lot of things, but biblically speaking, in the scriptures, we should wake up with the knowledge and the desire and the promise that God's mercy
mercy is more. It's new. It's there again. And that's such an encouraging thing for us as we wake up in the morning to think his mercy is going to be new. So this song declares his mercy is more. Whatever darkness, whatever sin, whatever you are going through, his mercy is more. Well, I'm really thankful this morning that we get to hear from Mike Tolliver. Um, this week was my aunt's funeral and some other things, and it just worked really well that Mike was willing and able to study God's Word and uh, to bring a message this morning that God has laid upon his heart. So let's just pray for the message, and then I'll turn the time over to Mike. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the week that you've brought us through and the way that your Word can be a light to our path, um, Lord, to just shine one step at a time, to give us 
a focus for what's ahead. Lord, I pray that you would be with Mike. I pray that you'd give him the words that all that he studied would just come forth from you and um, that we would all receive the blessing um, that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Mike, you come and share. So, Thanks, Kurt. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Glad that you, we could meet together and uh, look into God's Word. You know, last Monday, I believe it was, a friend of mine, uh, Gideon, actually up in Mitchell, from when I used to live up there, sent a video out, and a lot of you have probably already seen that. And if you haven't, uh, if you go to YouTube and just do a search for Trump History by Clarence Sexton, that is Trump History by Clarence Sexton. And it's only about four minutes long, but it's very powerful. And, you know, he talks about revival. Now, this morning, we're not going to talk about revival. However, though, several weeks back before all of this social distancing and everything went into effect, at one of our men's Bible studies, we, Kurt, Pastor Kurt was talking, and we were talking about revival. And he had mentioned that, you know, for a revival to really break forth, that it needed to start in the church and then go out from there. Well, if you, if you stop and think about it, the church is not these four walls. It's you and I. We are the kingdom of God, or we're in the kingdom of God. And for a revival to start within us, there's two things that you have to have. Now, this is just two, there's, there's more, but two of the main ones is love and forgiveness. And that's what we're gonna look at this morning is, is forgiveness. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind as, as far as revival goes, as we look to God's word this morning. So if you turn to Matthew chapter 18, Matthew chapter 18. Now, Jesus is talking to the disciples here and uh, what I want to share with you this morning, I looked at several different commentaries. I want to share with you on what, what they said, and then as we go along here, whatever God wants to, wants to uh, say as well. And my understanding from looking at this was basically, uh, the, uh, one commentator basically said that these are the attitudes and qualities that kingdom people should have. So, if you look at verse 21, that's where we're going to start. It's a very familiar passage, very familiar verse, and uh, uh, there's differing opinions on why Peter brought this up. And one of those was that if you look back uh, uh, to uh, verse 15, where it begins about the discipline part, church, church discipline, Peter may have still had that on his mind. And so about forgiving your brother. So in verse 21, Peter comes, and this is what he says. He says, Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Let's stop there for a moment. In that day and time, the rabbis would teach that forgiveness, that is, you only had to forgive a person three times. I believe it was for the same offense. But three times, on that fourth time, you know, you don't have to forgive anybody anymore. Well, uh, one commentator went all the way back to Amos. Um, I didn't look that up, but he said that's, that could be where that came from or something like that. But nevertheless, this is what Peter grew up around, and this is what was being taught. So we all know kind of Peter's personality, and I love one commentator said that Peter was probably feeling like he was being very loving when he come up and told Jesus, well, okay, let's do seven times. Now remember, in the Bible, seven is a number of perfection. So when you look at that, uh, maybe Peter thought, hey, the rabbis are saying three times, I'm not gonna go six, I'm gonna go seven. But for whatever reason, Peter was looking, as they said, for some type of a measuring rod or a measuring stick. But when Jesus said, Peter, 
it's not just seven times, but 70 times seven. I can just see Peter, just his mouth fall open, hit the floor, and it's like, what are you talking about, Lord? So when Jesus said that, he basically was saying, Peter, forgiveness doesn't have a limit. True forgiveness is something that, that all of us as born again believers, we have to be willing. We have to uh, draw on the strength of the Holy Spirit to be able to forgive over and over and over. And I'll tell you what, I know in my life, that hasn't been easy. Forgiveness does not come easy. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus meant, or, or said this to Peter, then Jesus opens this up with this parable. And we'll begin in verse 23. Jesus said, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle his accounts with his slaves or his servants. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before the, the king saying, have patience with me and I will repay you everything. And the king of that servant felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. Now let's back up for a moment here. Here you have a servant that has is, that is been doing the king's business. And for whatever reason, the king now said, it's time to settle these accounts. Dr. Warren Wearsby believes that this guy was actually a thief, uh, that he had taken money, who knows, maybe he was living a pretty lavish lifestyle, don't know. However, when it came time to settle these accounts, this man did not have the money. And to give you some kind of perspective, I know in my Bible at the bottom, there's a little note and maybe in yours too. But as, as you looked and as I saw other commentary on this, this 10,000 talents, one talent was equivalent to 20 years worth of wages of a laborer. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. If somebody worked for 40 years, in their lifetime, that would be two talents. It would take this man, based on that math, it would take this man 5,000 lifetimes. Think about that, 5,000 lifetimes to pay the king back. This was something that this man could not pay back. It, it, it was impossible. It was too big a debt. And so when he fell down on the ground, you know, and, and prostrated himself and said, Lord, King, we just give me some time. Give me some patience. You know, there, as I was reading through some of this, one person said that his, his actual response really didn't make any sense. And another person said that it, when the disciples heard this, they probably just laughed. They thought it was humorous because they knew that, that there was no way that could be paid back. I think what happened is that this servant you know, he really didn't know what was going to happen. And when he was looking at a life sentence in prison, so to speak, um, I think he started grasping for straws. You know, just, you know, just give me some more time. Just give me some patience and so forth. But this king, he had to be somewhat of a decent guy because it tells us that he felt compassion or he was moved with compassion. And he told this slave, this servant, he said, I am going to forgive all of this debt. Now that had to be a, a big relief because again, what the king was going to do was take him, his wife, his children, all of his possessions and sell them. And, and as I was reading, uh, I didn't realize this, but they said a slave, a servant, in that time when they would sell, the top price would be one talent, a single talent. But they said more often, 
it was like one tenth of that. So there's no way, even if the, if the king had thrown him in prison, sold all of their stuff, there's no way he would have got anywhere close to what he was owed. But as they said, some justice would have been served. But instead of justice here, we see compassion and we see love. So that should have had an effect on this servant. Now remember what I said before, Dr. Wearsby said that this man was probably a thief. I can tell you right now, this particular person that we're talking about, this guy was a complete jerk. This guy did not care in any way, shape or form of this great debt that was just forgiven him. I can actually see this guy walking out, getting away from the king and going, whoo, man, that was a close one. Man, I gotta be more careful here because boy, I just, uh, I dodged a bullet on that and it's like, whoa, you know, I think that was his attitude. And the reason I say that is because right after this, this um, uh, uh, thing with the king, look what it says in verse 28. It says, but that slave, the one who was just forgiven all of that debt, went to one of his fellow servants, his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. Now, let's look at this contrast here. This one servant was forgiven 10,000 talents. Like I said, 5,000 lifetimes to pay this back. And he goes out and he finds or comes across another person who owes him some money. Now this, this hundred denarii, a denarii was approximately a day's wage. So, you know, this was about three and a half months worth of wages. And, and like the one commentator said, it wasn't any small sum of money. However, this man showed absolutely no compassion, no mercy, no, no anything. He walked up and he grabbed this guy by the throat. And, and the Greek word there, for if I understood that right, it's like it's half choking. I mean, this, this, this guy is literally half choking this other guy saying, pay me my money. You know, I don't watch a lot of modern television I like a lot of the old, the older shows, but you know, this reminds me of one of those strong arm tactics that you would see in one of those police shows, you know, somebody saying, Hey, I'll be back next week. And you know, you're, you're going to give me my money. I mean, this is one of these things that was not good. This man didn't care and he wanted his money. And if he couldn't get it, he just went and threw the guy in debtor's prison. And that's terrible folks. I mean, they're just, you can see that the impact of the, the, of the big debt that he was forgiven, it made absolutely no impact on this man. So in verse 31, now we don't know if these fellow servants or the fellow slaves, some people believe that they were actually in the room, so to speak, or around when the king forgave this guy all this debt. And, uh, I, you know, it doesn't really say one way or the other, but irregardless, there were people out there that saw what happened. And in verse 31, it says, so when his fellow slaves saw what happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. So these guys, whoever they were, saw this incident and they went back to the king. Now remember, these servants are outdoing the king's business. And it could have been one of those things, if these guys hadn't been in the room, maybe they said, man, you know, this, this doesn't look real good for the kingdom here. We, we, <laughs> we gotta go let the king know about this. And the king found out about it 
And verse 32 says that he summoned him, summoned him in. Now, you know, uh, several years ago, there was a movie, I, if I remember right, Queen Esther. If you remember Queen Esther and Mordecai and Haman and, and so forth. And I thought it, I thought it was a pretty, good, a pretty good movie. And there was one scene in that movie where Haman didn't know yet that, that Esther was a Jew. And you remember when Esther invited Haman and the king to a dinner. She did that twice. Well, there's one scene in this movie where Haman is talking to his wife. And man, he's just, he's just thrilled. The gallows are being built, I believe, at that time. So he figures he's going he's gonna to hang Mordecai. And he tells his wife, he said, the queen, the queen invited the king and just myself. You know, he was flying pretty high. And I wonder, I wonder here about this servant. You know, the king had treated him with that compassion and mercy. And now he's told, hey, the king wants to see you. And I just thought about that. Was this guy kind of flying high going, oh, what does the king want now? You know, he forgave me of all this debt. What, what, was it? what does he want? He could maybe, maybe at the same time, maybe he thought, oh, maybe he, he's not going to forgive me. But nevertheless, he shows up. And boy, did he have a surprise waiting for him. In verse 32, it says, Then summoning him, his lord, that is the king, said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And the king, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. So we see here, this servant comes back in. And we see the complete opposite now. Because in verse 27, it told us that the king felt or was moved with compassion. And in verse 34, it says he was moved with anger. This man had been shown mercy and he basically threw it right back in the king's face. So now the mercy is gone and now we have justice. I like what Dr. Wearsby said. If you notice right there in verse 34, when it says that he should be handed over to the torturers, this time it didn't include his wife, his children, or his possessions. So there was still some compassion there, I believe, from the king. And you know, folks, this parable, I need to point out, and Dr. Wearsby said this before he even started uh, his commentary on it. He said, this parable is about forgiveness between brothers and sisters in the kingdom of God. This is not about God forgiving sinners. That's not what this is about, so don't confuse the two because if you do and you read through this, you could get the wrong impression of God. It's pretty clear, as one commentator said, you and I, if you are a true born again believer, we have been forgiven so much. We have been forgiven a debt that none of us could ever repay. Never. I don't care if we live 10,000 lifetimes. You would never, ever pay back the sin debt. Our sin against God, it's impossible. That's why Jesus came. And what Jesus is saying here is that if you are a born-again believer, yes, you have been forgiven much so that anything in this life that is done to us or our family or our nation, 
We should have the spirit of forgiveness. It's that contrast of great to small. There's nothing. I can guarantee you this, folks. There is nothing in this world that can compare to the sin debt that we owe God. Nothing. But yet, forgiveness is so hard. If you are watching this this morning and you've never come before Jesus Christ and asked for the forgiveness of your sins, told him that you do believe that he shed his precious blood at Calvary and you accept that as your payment for your sin debt, you ask him to come into your life, into your heart, to be Lord and Savior, Ask him to save you from an eternity and the lake of fire and then commit your life to him. If you've never done that, it's my prayer this morning you would do that. And if you have already done that, maybe right now God's bringing somebody to your attention that maybe you need to forgive. Or maybe, you know, somebody forgave you and you never accepted that forgiveness. Maybe you need to talk to him about it. You know, if you were at Bible study this last uh, Wednesday night, we were looking at procrastination. And I have to tell you, on, on uh, my, my message here this morning, I did procrastinate, and, and especially at the very end, what Jesus said here. It was, it was uh, and, and I'm going to be honest with you folks, I don't fully understand everything that Jesus is saying here. And there are different, different opinions on this. But something that I was sensing in my heart, and then as I read a few more commentaries, and that kind of confirmed, here's what I believe Jesus is saying here. That if you are a born-again believer, and Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, if you propose in your heart not to forgive, there are going to be consequences for that. And you can back that up with scripture. You can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Pastor Kurt talks about it when we, when we have communion, when we have the Lord's Supper. That, you know, when you, when you uh, 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 look at yourself, when you're examining yourself, you know, you, you, you don't want to bring judgment against you by taking the Lord's Supper if you shouldn't. You know, there were some people there that had actually died. God had called home that were true born again believers, but they were not coming in to the Lord's Supper the way that they should. Uh, another commentator, not only with that, that scripture, they also had um, Hebrews chapter 12, you know, the discipline of God. If, if you think that you are going to be God's child, and they're going to be, there's going to be any part of Scripture that you say, well, I'm not going to live by that. God's only going to let you go for so long. There are consequences, but God is always willing to forgive. He's, that, that's, that's, that's why his love is there, is for forgiveness. That's, that, that is always reconciliation, restoration. That is God's heart. And that's what God wants from us. But... The only way that we're going to get there is if we allow the Spirit to work in us to make us more like Jesus so that he can work out his plan through us. Because I'm going to tell you something. If you think that you're going to forgive in the way that God wants you to and you're going to do it without his Spirit, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. You, be, you may be able to mend over some things. You may be able to have things good for a while. But if you do not forgive from your heart, what did Jesus say right there? And did you notice, and I didn't catch this. Doctor, I think it was Dr. Wearsby and somebody else pointed this out. He didn't say your heavenly father, our heavenly father. In verse 35, he said, my heavenly father will also do the same to you if each of you do not forgive his brother from your heart. Folks, the older I get, and as I look through scripture, everything, everything that Jesus talks about, that Jesus does, 
It's always a heart issue. That's what it comes down to. And Jesus wants to change that heart. Ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior if you haven't done that today. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you for this, this story. I thank you that uh, Peter, uh, regardless of why he asked, you gave us clarification that forgiveness is unlimited. Lord, you've done that for us at the cross. It doesn't mean that we can do what we want. But it means you don't hold anything against us once we accept you as Lord and Savior. Thank you for that hope. Thank you for that promise. And Lord, even, even in my life, I just pray that for everyone that's listening this morning, I pray for, for anyone that's watching this, I just ask, Father, that you would touch their heart if they haven't accepted you as Lord and Savior, that they would do it right now. And if, if they have, if they are a born-again believer, a child of the kingdom, Lord, just bring to mind if there's anybody we need to forgive or, or anything with forgiveness that we need to deal with. Let the Holy Spirit lead and guide and direct us. We just thank you for the greatness of the sin debt that you forgave and that the cross, the cross was bigger than that to overcome and to cleanse and wash away all of our sins if we'll accept it. Blessed be your name, Father. We just love you, praise you, and thank you. And I love you, Lord. And all the, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And folks, I want to finish here. I just want to close. In 1 Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 4, and verse 8, listen to what Peter says. He says, above all, keep fervent in what? Your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. That's how we forgive, folks. We have to have the love of God working in us and through us to forgive. God bless you. Thank you for being with us this morning. You all have a great week and be safe. Thank you, Mike. Oh, that was great. I appreciate that. I do believe that the path to revival is forgiveness within the body of Christ. Take a step. And if, if I've done something to offend you, um, let's get things right. Let's, as the body of Christ, rebuild that love. Ephesians 4 says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. If we're struggling to forgive, let's look back to what Jesus did for us. Great parable that Jesus taught. Thanks, Mike, for sharing. We're going to sing, Love Lifted Me. And that's going to focus on the forgiveness that Jesus gave to us that we can extend to others. Love Lifted Me, 516. <laughs>
It's looking like May 10th is probably a, a possibility for getting back together to worship in person, but we're not going to uh, rush, just take it a week at a time. I, I want to leave you with Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Have a blessed week. Take care. God bless.